Let me begin with an icebreaker question once again. How many of you are a mountain person or how many of you are a beach, beach person? So the question is, if I have a vacation, would I choose to go to a mountain or to a beach? So for this one, I want to see a show of hands. So how many of you are actually a mountain person? Oh, interesting, right? Mountain, good, good. How many of you, I guess I'm assuming the rest of you are beach person, but let's still see a show of hands. How many of you would rather go to a beach for your vacation? All right. It's really interesting because, um, you know, I don't know how much uh, we could rely on that, but I found one interesting, you know, article on website that said, actually, you know, it kind of is determined or it kind of shows your personality too. You know how nowadays people are really into the MBTIs and things like that. Well, it turns out if you're a mountain person, you are actually more often than not, uh, we have the more, uh, we have more uh, introverts uh, who are mountain people. And those who are extroverts are more beach kind of person, right? So, yeah. But for me, I think I would choose to go to a mountain if I'm doing my silence and solitude retreat. But if I'm going for my vacation, I'd rather go to a beach or something like that. So I don't know. I guess it's a little bit of both. And I'm sure all of you are like that too. Well, there's a, um, a preacher and a, a teacher of preaching by the name of Stephen J. Lawson. And he actually says that today's passage, Romans 8, chapter 30 and 39, he describes it as the height of Mount Everest. So you got this whole mountain range of the story that's running from Genesis to Revelation. And he says that this passage is the height of of Mount Everest. And we see why. Because if you see the verse again, it says this, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a huge declaration. And I can see why he would say this is the height of Mount Everest. And it's the ultimate point towards which everything in the Bible is moving to and moving towards. And this is where we get to the top. And when you get to the top, what it says is that nothing can separate us from the love of God. But notice, it says that it's not just any love, but love that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's why this is this love cannot. This is a love, and, and we will not. It will not be able to separate us from this love because this love is the love that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we want to talk about what this love is, and. We're going to jump all the way back to the beginning of the Bible today, Genesis 1 to 3. And then we will examine those chapters and we will come back to the letter of Romans, which we've been looking at from Romans 1 to 8, and tie the two together and come back to this very verse and try to see what Paul means when he says this love is the love that we get and through in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let's go to Genesis 1. It begins this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I don't know if you ask this question ever in your life, this question of who am I? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do in life? Well, we may not ask it in this exact word, but all of us human beings, at one point or another, we come to this question of our existence. It may be something as simple as, what am I supposed to major in? It's the same question. Um, what am I supposed to do in life for my job, my career? It might be just like a career question or school major question, but underneath that, there's a fundamental foundational question that we all human beings ask, why am I here? What am I here for? 
What's my purpose in life? Well, the world may tell us, keep looking into yourself. Look into your heart. But what the Bible tells us is, you got to go to Genesis 1, and you have to learn about who God is first before you can find the answer to who you are. And the reason is because this God is your creator. And that's why you need to go to him and learn about him first, find out who he is before you can find out who you are. Verse 2, now the earth was formless and empty and darkness. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. Those three words, formless, empty, and dark. You see, the Bible tells us, before God comes into your life, this is your existence. This is your life. It's formless. It's empty. You're covered in darkness. But notice verse 3, God says, let there be light, and there was light. And this is what Christian life is all about, friends. Christian life is while we find ourselves in darkness, word of God comes, and through his word, light comes. And our darkness disappears. This is what Christian life and Christianity is all about. So we are in darkness, but God comes and light comes into our life. And then Genesis 1 also tells us that God created us human beings, you and me. And this is what it says about us. Verse 27, so God created mankind in his own image. What this means is God created us in a special relationship. We are created to be his children. And that's what the image of God means. And what that means is your number one purpose in life is to have a relationship with this God who created you. Image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God says to human beings, God bless them. And said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God blesses us human beings. You know, realize that the life that God wants us to have is a life of blessing. And what does that blessing entail? Well, it's a life of fruitfulness that we live, that it's a life of creativity, productivity, that we have a reason why we're created, and God has placed us in this world to have a fruitful life wherever you go, that there's fruitfulness because of you. You walk into a room, and there's fruitfulness and joy and happiness because you are living this life of fruitfulness that God has designed and called and, and willed for you to live. He also says, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over everything that I have created. A life of authority. Instead of being ruled by the things around you. How many of you feel like that in your life? Whether it's your work schedule, whether it's the pressure of, of uh, keeping your family together, or just pressure of just living life. Instead of being ruled by it, ruled under it, God has planned our lives so that we will live to rule over it. That we would have control over it. We would have authority over all these things in our lives. Instead of letting those things have authority over us. And then God says, I give every green plant for food. Meaning, I give this life for your enjoyment. A life of prosperity. This is the reason why God has created us human beings, to have a life and live a life of creativity, productivity, life of authority, life of prosperity. And then God says, verse 31, all that he had made, and it was very good. He was happy to see us after he created us. So this emptiness that we read about at the beginning, 
God comes in and he begins his work of creation and this life of emptiness becomes a life of meaningfulness. This is what Christian life is all about. And then on the seventh day, this is what he does. He, verse, chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from his work. Then God blessed, blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now this rest. This is not God who got tired after working so hard for six days and on the seventh day, I need to take a nap. That's not what this rest is about. This is a rest where God created everything in the universe so beautifully, so gloriously, and His human beings that He loves and created to be His children, their lives are filled with God's purpose, God's meaning, for meaningfulness that comes from living that life of purpose. And as a result of that, God is joyful over these human beings and the human beings are also joyful because they enter into God's joy together. It's a rest of celebration. It's a rest of peace. It's a rest of dwelling in this love and joy that God has planned for us human beings. So in the beginning, God created everything in the universe, but then formlessness with which it began is now filled with God's fullness. That's what our Christian life and Christianity is all about. We find ourselves in a state of formlessness. We find ourselves in a, in a state, of, state of emptiness. And we find ourselves in darkness, but God comes into our lives and God makes our life full, and He fills it with His purpose, and He brings light into our lives. But the problem is, we always get robbed of this life. Doesn't it feel like that? I mean, if that's the a purpose for which God has created us, why does this life get robbed from us so often and so easily? Why is it so easily taken away from us if that's what God wanted us to have and do? And this is where we get to Genesis chapter 2 and 3. Because after God creates everything, He plants a garden. And then He places the human being in the garden. And in chapter 2, verse 16 of Genesis, this is what He says, And the Lord God commanded the man, human beings, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And this is what he says. Well, this is a life that I planned for you, but now you are in a garden. And, but there are two potential, uh, two possibilities in that garden. One is that this garden will be a prosperous garden, but the other option, possibility, is that it will turn into a wasteland. Then what does it depend on? Who does it depend on? He says, well, it depends on you. Why is that? Because God gave human beings freedom to choose either one. You're free to eat everything in this garden, but you must not eat from this one tree. And when you choose that tree and the fruit from that tree, you will certainly die. Why is that? Because it's an option, two options between either trusting God's word and obeying Him, or it's choosing what you think is best and choosing that life, and that will lead to death. Isn't this so true for our life also? Because our lives are meant to be this garden that God has created for us. But our day, our week, our month, our year, our life is also filled with these two possibilities. But then choice is ours. So depending on what we choose, either our lives, our day become a beautiful garden or depending on what we choose, it becomes a wasteland. 
But the problem is, it seems like we too often choose the wrong thing. And we cannot help but choose the wrong thing. That's the problem. It is a garden, beautiful garden that God has given to us, our life. But it seems that we cannot help but choose the wrong thing over and over and over again. How many of you feel that way? So often I feel like that. Here's this beautiful day that God has given to me, this life, gift of life that is given to me. And this is supposed to be this beautiful garden. But why is it that I keep choosing the wrong thing? Well, the Bible in Genesis 3 tells us the reason why we keep choosing the wrong thing. In that garden is a snake. And this snake comes and tempts the human beings. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Of course he did. But then the snake comes and says, Really? Is that really what God said? That you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Plants a seed of doubt. Isn't that how it begins? We have our day and we have the two possibilities. But plant doubt is seed of doubt is planted in our minds and we begin to start choosing and looking at this lie and we begin to turn towards this lie more and more. First to the woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. God never said you must not touch it. He just said don't eat it. But now this lie is planted. Now the truth is being twisted in the, person, in, in the human being's mind. And then the serpent knows that he's got her. So verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Now the serpent just twists completely the word of God. And the human beings, they choose the lie and they act on this lie. And as a result of this, what comes into them is this sin. Sin comes into their lives and what we see in Genesis 3 is the a working out of this sin now that is in them. Disobedient, that the broken relationship with God, out of which comes this, uh, these uh, things that come out of them because of the sin now that is in them. Verse 6, chapter 3. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desire for, for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Let's note, see what happens with them. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made covering for themselves. What did they do? They covered themselves. Why did they cover themselves? Because they realized they were naked. What, what does it mean that they realized they were naked? Well, to use the word that we use in our modern days, now they were feeling ashamed. When we feel shame, that's what we do. We cover ourselves. As you're looking at their responses, I want you to think about what response do I turn to when sin in me begins to work? There are some of you who continue to cover yourselves. Maybe many, uh, those of us who grew up in that culture of shame, maybe this is something that we just learn to do. We hide, we cover ourselves so that we don't show that we are ashamed. Second thing that they do, man and his wife and the sound of the Lord God, he heard the sound of the God, he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. The second response that they show is they hid. Why? Because they were afraid. Could this be your response? 
Verse 11, God says, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. What is the man doing? He gives excuse, and he blames. I don't know about you, but I wonder if this is something that all of us fall into at some point in our lives, right? Like something happens and, and we try to protect ourselves by covering ourselves, by hiding, but then we get exposed. Our ugliness is exposed, right? It's like you hide, you cover, but then you're exposed and you're pushed into the corner and the mo what the natural response that comes to us is, it's not my fault. It's her fault. It's his fault. We give excuse. We blame. The woman, the man said, the woman put here, right? Uh, she gave me the fruit. Well, God, no, verse 13, said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. She also gives excuse, but in her response, we see something that takes place in us. When sin grabs hold of us, and it's this, we fall into deception. So we see what sin has done in us. And what God does is God evicts them out of the garden. Genesis 3, verse 22. The Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. So God kicks them out of the garden and he blocks the entrance so that human beings will not come back into the garden that God had created for them. Well, how do you feel about this God? Do you feel that this God is too harsh? Why couldn't he just say, well, but I will forgive you anyway? Well, it might feel like this God is really harsh, but this is actually an act of mercy on God's part. Because you see the flaming sword flashing back and forth. You see, in the, garden of, uh, uh, in the garden that God has created, that nothing impure, nothing sinful could enter. So the moment that human beings try to enter back into the garden, they will be struck down by the holiness and the purity of God. So this is the next best thing that God would, could do, is that he will kick them out, make sure that they don't come back into God's presence, because if they do, they'll experience his holiness, and they will perish as a result of his holiness. But something really interesting happens in this chapter, Genesis 3. While God kicks the human beings out of the Garden of Eden, he does two things. Number one, he promises. Genesis 3.15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So he says to the woman, a descendant, your offspring will come, and your offspring will crush the head of the serpent, head of the enemy that tried to destroy you and deceived you. Your son, your offspring will do that. So God promises. Second thing he does is God prepares. Verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. So as he's kicking them out of the garden, he takes garments of skin, which implies that he had to kill an animal to make this garment of skin, and he clothes them before he kicks them out of, or as they're being evicted out of the Garden of Eden. How are you guys doing? I know today we're looking at a lot more passages than we usually do. But I, I had to, so hang in there. So we finished Genesis 1 to 3 now. And we jump back to Romans, and we've been looking at this. And I want to tie what we've just talked about to Romans. 
Romans chapter 1, as we saw already, begins this way. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the good news of God. But what does it say that this good news is about? The gospel, good news, he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David. This son, Genesis 3.15, promised that offspring who will come to crush the head of, your, head of the enemy, the serpent, well, here he is. The letter of Romans begins by saying it. You know who that offspring is? Jesus, the Son of God. And it's really interesting when we go to Romans 1, how Romans 1 ties what it says there to Genesis. Romans 1.18 we talked about how the gospel of God is God revealing his righteousness. And as he revealed his righteousness, the first thing that comes up is his, his uh, holy wrath. Because him being righteous and holy God, he will not allow sin to just be. So he has to, by nature, reveal his holy wrath towards sin. So we talked about that wrath of God already. But notice how it says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. But notice it doesn't say a truth. They suppress the truth. Why is that? Because this truth that Paul's talking about is the truth about God's creation. Verse 19, Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. Verse 20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. People who suppress the truth about the creation of God. Creation of God that says, God is the one who created everything in the universe, including us human beings. And we are created in his own image. We are created to be his children. We are created to be his vice regents who will not only receive his blessings, but rule everything for God. That truth, those who suppress that truth, God will pour his holy wrath upon those who suppress that truth. Going on, verse 21. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Do you hear the allusion to Genesis 1? What happened in Genesis 1? God is at the top. He is the creator God who's underneath that, human beings that he's created. And it is through the human beings that God will rule and reign over all these birds of the air and animals and fishes. But notice what is said. The order is now totally reversed and flipped. Now who's on top of human beings? These images of these birds and animals and reptiles and human beings are now created idols out of these creation of God and they're bowing down before this creation of God which God has made. Creation purpose totally ruined, destroyed. That allusion to Genesis 1. Verse 24, therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for lie, worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. So now, human beings live in lie. Following the lie. Verse 28. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, 
So God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. It's quite harsh. But then as I read through this, I was like, is there at least one thing that I'm caught under? And I don't want to, I won't tell you what it is, but I am caught under at least one of these things. And what the Word of God is saying is, Genesis 3 is still happening with you. It's still happening with all of us. And we are caught in sin. And we are caught under the power of sin and we live under its influence and power. So Paul is very honest about where we are and who we are. But then remember the two things. Promise that offspring will come. Remember that preparation. God um, sacrificing that animal to uh, clothe human beings. Then Romans moves on to say, well, that promise is Jesus. And when he died on the cross, that's the fulfillment of that promise in Genesis 3. So Romans 3.23 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. But literally in Greek, you could say it in Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood. Do you see the connection with G, uh, that offspring and then that animal, that sacrifice in Genesis? Well, I am going to send that offspring and that offspring will die on the cross and shed his blood and as a result of his blood you will be reconciled and restored back to this God and the life that you were meant to live. And that's what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. Going from judgment to justification. Going from separation to reconciliation. And that's what happened when Jesus died on the cross. If you remember the story in the gospel where you know how when Jesus died on the cross, the moment he breathed his last, there was a place where the curtain was torn into. Do you remember that, the Holy of Holies? Well, you know what happened? Eden was supposed to be where we dwell with God. But then we were kicked out of this life in Eden. But then God says to the Israelites, this is where I cannot go the entire Old Testament, but God says to the Israelites, will you create a tabernacle? And within that tabernacle, will you prepare this place called the Holy of Holies? And it will be divided and, and with this curtain, but I will dwell there with you, you people of Israel. So if you cannot come into it, but I will go and give you this place, the holy of holies which it was supposed to represent the garden of eden but the entrance was shut tight because of this separation but the moment jesus died and shed his blood bible says the curtain was torn in two and our way back into the garden of eden where god is the life of eden life full of blessing and purpose and living in God, living with God, is now fully restored. The way has been made and you can now walk back into this garden that God had planned for him and us to live in together. So through that Jesus, that's what God has done. And that's why this love, let's look at verse 39 again. This love of God that is in Christ Jesus, nothing will separate us from this love. Because it's entirely what God in Christ Jesus, what Jesus has done is not dependent on us, any one of us or anything we've done, but it's entirely dependent on Him. 
That's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Nothing can separate us from this love of God that is in Christ Jesus, because this is a love that God promised. This is a love that God prepared. And this is a love that God provided. If it took Jesus' death to give us this love, nothing, nothing can separate us from this love as long as we are in Christ Jesus. So here's our takeaway for today. So friends, be certain of God's love for you. Those of you who love to hike in, and climb you know, those mountains and so on, what is it about standing on the top of a mountain that renews us? Because when we stand on the top, we begin to breathe in this new, fresh air. And when we stand on the top of a mountain and we look down, we begin to see our world differently. When you're down there, that, that problem seems so big, right? But then when you go up and stand on the top of God's love and the uh, top of uh, uh, um, the gospel of Jesus Christ, you realize it's so small. I'm always amazed by how everything is so small when you go up there. But then when you're down there, it's so big. My failure, that seems so big. But when you climb up to the mountain of God and stand on the top of the mountain of the gospel of Jesus Christ, where there's this love is given to me and nothing can separate me from this love, that failure all of a sudden starts to look much smaller. The words that I heard that hurt me from someone, when I'm down there, it, sounds, it seems so big. But when I'm standing up here and looking at down from this place called God's love that cannot be separated from me, it begins to become much smaller. Even this life that someone else uh, beside you have this huge mansion that, that your friend owns. And when you're looking at it from down there and you're driving by it and passing by it, it's like, why is that person so, how, so big and so rich and mansion-like? And I've got this dinky little place I live in. Why is my life so terrible? You go up and stand on the top of a mountain, look down, your house, that person's mansion, they're all small. Same small little thing that you see. And this is what God's love is. This love is amazing because when we stand on there, we begin to see it differently. And this is why throughout the letter of Romans from chapter 1 to 8, I've been like dying to tell you about this love, but I couldn't tell you because I had to tell you all these other things first. And what's tragic about the gospel is that gospel of Jesus Christ is about love of God, but we make this love of God so, so, something so insignificant because in order to talk about this love fully, we have to talk about the wrath of God, that God does not like sin and God despises sin. So when he finds sin in us, that he is someone who gets angry and he shows his wrath towards sin. And as soon as we talk about that, so many people will just shut down their ears and say, well, if God is someone who is angry, I don't want that God. But his anger is towards sin. Things that destroy us. Things that bring us to death. He's angry about those things. But instead of pouring that wrath upon us because that sin is in us, he sends his son Jesus, puts him on the cross, and just like that animal that was sacrificed, God poured all of his wrath towards sin upon Jesus. And Jesus fully absorbed all of God's wrath so that we do not have to receive any of God's wrath. 
towards sin. And I had to tell you that first. But so many people today, as soon as we talk about sin, as we soon as talk about God's anger towards sin, everyone just say, well, I don't want that God. Screw that God then. I don't want God who is angry. But we don't realize that anger of God is out of his love towards us. If someone for no good reason would come and hurt Diane or my children, you bet I will be angry. This is my anger that comes out of my love for my wife and my children. And that's the anger that God showed towards sin. But he knew and he wanted to show love, not pour anger on us, but give nothing but his love to us. So God sends his son Jesus and says, I'll pour all my holy anger on Jesus so that I can just give you my love and you can look at that cross and choose me again. This is, this is how big the love of God in Jesus Christ is. And because of that, nothing can separate us from this love. And I hope and pray that some of you, many of you, all of you will come to that love today again as things are shaking in your life, as things are crumbling apart, the same old problem is coming back again, same old struggle and battles are coming back again, as you're thinking, well, is, is, is God's love now, has it ended? Uh, is love is no longer there for me? Be certain of God's love. Stand on top of that mountain again and look down again. Whatever is happening, one thing that will not change, nothing, even this problem, even this condition, even this situation cannot separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. If I could invite the priest him to come back again. Thanks for hanging in there today. So I went longer than I, I usually do. But I want to invite you as you sing this last song to climb up that mountain again and stand on, the, on top of that mountain of God's love, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Breathe in that air of the Holy Spirit. Just picture yourself going up again, standing there with your arms wide open, breathing in the air of the Holy Spirit, fresh air of the Holy Spirit that God wants to pour and breathe into you. And then open the eyes of your heart and start seeing it again. And God will show and you will see it differently. Because now you're certain that nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Would you all stand and let's sing this song together before we end?